actually good episode this week. No, really, I don't have that much to complain about this time. As with Loop, uh, Loopat, they are actually fin finally managing to click as characters. Um, in the aftermath of um, Raiden, right? I actually have my phone with me this time, so I should actually look him look up his name. Uh, my phone just died. Now you can't but yeah, with the um, I'm pretty sure his name is Raiden. Um, but with him, he wrecks the, um, all the vehicles and mechs, leaving the Potter Ranger injured and Noel the most heavily hit. He is rescued from the aftermath and taken in by Kyrie and the Lupin Ranger crew, and it, it finally gets into a bit of exploration of what he's after in all of this, and apparently he also has someone he wants to see revived by the Lupin Collection. Now, we don't know if this is a manipulation or a truthfulness from him, because, as I said, it kind of feels like the guy, instead of bringing the teams together, is playing a bit on both sides. Not that he's a terrible character, or a terrible person yet, but there's definitely something more going on with him than what we've been seeing. And that's kind of why I'm... He's a good character, but there's something that makes me apprehensive about him. Like, um, again, the astronomer quote, I'm on my side. It just, it really seems to denote what's, uh, up with him. Um, he tries to get in an in with Kyrie, who is now on the distrustful front with, uh, Noel, and, well, the way he gets in is to, is, as we, I said, to, um, announced that he has someone he wants to revive, and using the angle of Kyrie's brother and the other's loved ones as why he might have been recruited for the maintenance of the Lupin Collection in the first place, and its, it's gathering would it be able, would allow everyone to uh, get what they want from, from everything. And this is part of his motivation as the tech expert of the team, as he has to figure out how to open the Golden Safe. And, of course, the way they actually end up opening is it's the, um, the doll fighters only work with three numerical combinations. And it turns out the golden saves require a six-code numerical combination to open, meaning they need to use two doll fighters at the same time, meaning the previous tactic of uh, having two of the Lupin Ranger restrain the gangler to open the safe won't work. And even with um, them holding two of the uh, doll fighters in their hands, yeah, that's not exactly the easiest thing to deal with. Fortunately, they do have Lupin X to help out with that, but it's still not the same thing, considering the swapping around nature of his abilities and loyalties. However, that's where this episode actually clicks a bit. Raiden tries to get with, um... get the Ice Guy. I am forgetting the Ice Guy's name. I am terrible with names. But in my defense, he has shown up all of, like, two or three times in the series at this point, so it's not like he's been around and an active character for me to actually need to remember his name. Um, honestly, most of the recurring gangler are so, have so little presence in the show that it's easy to not remember any of their names. Um, it's mainly just been focused on monster, <coughs> excuse me, it's mainly been focused uh, on the Monster of the Week and then the occasional appearance by Ghosh to uh, make them grow giant. So it's not exactly the best use of the Monster Faction yet as well. But I, that it's the midpoint of the show. It is the dead center of where the show um, begins and ends. That might actually end up changing. Who knows? Um, but yeah, with the realization that um, they need a six-code... Uh, key to get past it, Tsukasa convinces the Pad Ranger to back up uh, the Lupin Ranger when they come to fight and in turn back them up, because the way the fight starts is Raiden goes after the Ice Guy. They start causing a ruckus. The Pad Ranger respond. Then Noel shows up, tries to get the, th the Golden Safe unlocked. It doesn't work, but then he realized the six code thing does, and the Lupin Ranger join the battle at this point as they show up. Kyrie and Noel have a moment about 
them both working hard to achieve the resurrections thereafter, though it would have helped more with selling Noel's character if we knew who he wanted to revive. Maybe he is actually a relative of Arsene Lupin. He is actually the benefactor and is coming in on his own bend, possibly. Uh, okay, that angle, now that I ruminate on it a bit more, doesn't work because... Um, I'm for also forgetting the guy's name. I am terrible with names today. That is, the servants of the Lupin family would know of Noel if he was actually a member of, of the family he served, so I guess that doesn't work. My apologies there, I just wasn't thinking of that. I'm really, really tired today, I've been working a lot. Um, so yeah, um, it would have helped a lot had we got an idea of who Noel's after in his revival in selling Kyrie, trying to gain some real trust with him. But regardless, um, because Umika and Tuma are um, shoved to the side and it's left with Kairi alone with the um, scissors dial fighter shield, um, Tsukasa convinces um, Sakya and Kate Shiro that they need to swallow their pride and actually start working with the Lupin Ranger to defeat the Gongler because the three of them, even with Noel helping out in the interim, is just not enough. The seven of them need to start collaborating as part of the bigger picture. And Sakia is mostly on board because he's never been that hostile, but it's basically Tsukasa finally stepping up to actually become the leader of the Pot Ranger because, well, let's face it, Keichiro's been a shithead for most of the show and as a result has lost most of those chances to actually do shit. So, Tsukasa stepping up, big points for the show. Very big points. Good job there. And they even lampshade this later, but I'll get to that. Regardless, it ultimately takes all seven of them restraining the Gongler to open the safe and remove the Lupin collection piece that was giving them such a hard time. Because the one that was in there, additionally Live Man based, was allowing... Raiden the ability to regenerate any damage he took, any stamina loss, pretty much anything that would have been damaging to him was just getting negated. So none of them would have been able... This is this is actually a perfect example of the monster that we should have been encountering before. The Potter Ranger have the physical force, the Looper Ranger have the um, tech ability to... They both bring something to the table on... Uh, the capacity to defeat the Gongler. The, the Powder Ranger can't do it alone. The Lupin Ranger can't do it alone. And so they need to swallow their pride, Keichiro, and actually collaborate, even though there's the stupid police and uh, private retrieval agent divide between them. So this is finally the show getting to where it really need to click. And I'm hoping that they advance this a bit more soon because... From the description of how the show worked, that they were supposed to be at odds at first, which they've done really, really poorly in my opinion, and um, ultimately come to work together. Noel was the seeding... Noel was... Noel's introduction was where they finally seemed to be doing that correctly. Because, as I keep em emphasizing through the early side of the show, the antagonism between both sides was making things more and more irreconcilable. So they could not, it was seeming less and less feasible for them to actually be able to come together. And it was driving a lot of us who were watching the show nuts because almost every time it was not the aloofness of the Lupin Ranger that was, that was the problem, it has been solely Kate Shiro as the shithead. Like that is not how you should be dealing with this. And of course, when Kate Shiro got away with that stuff, it made Sakia and Tsukasa look worse in turn. So, while when they have the starring outings, they are appealing characters, when they're shoved to the background to be Keichiro's yes-men, we've ended up hating them. Thus, Tsukasa stepping forward to actually take charge of the Power Ranger fixes most of these issues, because the reckless idiot team member not being the lead character, 
That is the good th moment. That is how most Super Sentai with such a character should be acting, as then they're not the team leader, they're not the protagonist, they're not the um, one getting the most spotlight, and resultantly, they can potentially get the character arc, because usually with how Super Sentai has dud Ren Rangers, is that they're almost consistently written not as someone on a character arc, though I can name many that have done so, but the one to be the role model and aspired towards, because the Reds usually take the main character protagonist role. Thus, you make a terrible main character protagonist, um, again, Raito, Takaharu, fucking lucky. Um, I don't want to say Hiromu was guilty of this, because he really wasn't in Go Busters. He just got uh, more focus than he should have in Go Busters writing. Um, what would be a good... Uh, John from Geki Ranger. That's another one I'm per I really despise. And um, I'm forgetting Magi Red's name. Yeah, those are examples of where they have cl very clearly failed at that. But um, back to the point, um, you need you can't have that kind of character up front and center and make that your you can't. There are so many idiot care idiot main protagonists out there that let's just face it, we we don't like, we hate. So. Someone more doing that, it's almost always a detraction to your product because there are few, like, few across the board who have ever written that well and make the idiot interpretation less about them being factually, factually brain dead and more specialized. Goku and Monkey D. Luffy are two, two examples of the specialized type in that they don't care about knowing a broad range of things, they just care about you know, what they specialize in or what their dream goals are. Uh, Luffy especially has shown himself in the One Piece series to be very intelligent and clever when the situations demand them. It's just that he's so happy-go-lucky he and um, not caring about things he d really should that he definitely gets the hits the idiot trope, but that's mainly for comedy more than actual brain, de brain deadness. Goku? No education. So... All he knows is martial arts, so that's, again, the Edith Savant type, where he's not that stupid, it's just that he doesn't care. Um, another example of one that's uh, good on this, of course, being J Jaden Yuki, at least the Japanese writing of the character, where he actually... It wasn't so much that he was bad at educational stuff, it's just that he was a slacker, which is, of course, a divide lost in the 4 kids stuff, but I'd, I'd, I digress. Most times an idiot character is used, people hate them. Like, little kids, they don't know the difference. As you grow up, you abide idiocy and characterization less, and if you want a show to have... Like, not so it's not disposable, you need to, at some point, either correct them, hold accountable to their actions, or make them step back so someone else can step forward to mend things, and Tsukasa taking charge over Keichiro, that's definitely the biggest evidence of the show course correcting from what made it so frustrating and irritating in the early parts, and okay, should have fixed this long before this, like you you lose people generally across the board when you don't fix, uh, fix, fix this or have that corrective action almost immediately, or show some other aspect of them that will, on the long term, mediate their um, nuances. I know I'm going off on a tangent on something I have discussed at length um, many, many times, but I really, really despise the unthinking, reckless idiot character, and ugh, Keichiro has been such a bullheaded zealot so, for so much of the show. And as I said when I started um, doing these recaps, clearly the um, source material they're drawing off of for this is less Arsene Lupin in the original novels, but more Lupin the Third with how Kyrie is like uh, Arsene Lupin the Third and Kate Sherwood is relatedly Zenigata. 
But Zenigata, while having a bullheaded zeal, wasn't an idiot, and he actually observed things around him and would work with the Lupin Rain with um with Lupin the Third and um make use of him to catch bigger criminals as there there is always a next time in the exchanges between them. This is something Keichiro, in turn, has refused to acknowledge. It is all, almost always all or nothing with him, and it has been extremely dangerous and damaging to everyone around him. Having Tsukasa steps up, step up, uh, glare at him, and rein in his actions is everything we have been wanting for... everything we've been wanting to happen with the guy. Because Tsukasa is the super competent one amongst the team, and so... Her being the one to actually put her foot down and get them to work, to get both teams to work together, since she has good relations with uh, Kairi and Umika, even though she doesn't know it's them. She has suspected it's them, but she has no idea it is actually them. And the um, evidence of what happened in the last two episodes, where um, Sukasa and Kairi got, uh, not Suka yeah, Sukasa and Kairi got a moment and mutual respect between them. That is everything you needed to more settle this and get for the working relationship. And that is no more emphasized than in this episode where Keichiro has, is body gripping the uh, monster's body in place with um, Umika, Tsukasa, Sakuya, and Toma using restraining lines to hold its arms apart and for Kairi and Noel to unlock the... Hit, unlock the save, and steal the regeneration item. That was all perfectly done. Granted, the directing for it is still crap, because it's that goddamn Q-Ranger director who just has awful, nauseating fight scenes, but it is... It is a good showcasing of the team finally coming together, and, um... Also, Good Striker finally having enough on the, um war over his use, and forcing both, all seven of them to combine their VS machines into the good... Okay, um... Good Striker has used the phrase, I've got a good feeling, um, throughout the show. So, and it has the same, uh, Japanese phrase behind it as good cool. And previously we have seen the name of the combination mech of um, X-Emperor, the Pat Kaiser Machines, the Lupin Kaiser Machines, and Good Striker as written as Good Cool Kaiser. Good Cool being a straight romanization of the Kuru phrase that um, Good Striker has been using. I primarily use TV Nihon as over time's creative liberties drive me crazy because I hear what they're saying in Japanese, and they're writing something that is in contradiction to what was written there. We were not we were very confused over where the cool, C-O-L-L, -L, was coming from. No, not cool. C-O-O-L. On top of everything I can't spell today. Um, yeah, we were not, we were, it did not make sense where that was coming from. That wasn't anything we were seeing coming from the show. None of the other uh, VS vehicles or combinations have that come in anywhere if the... but it then clicks and makes more sense when you think of the phrase as opposed to translate as feeling. Good feeling, Kaiser. As he has... as Good Striker has a good feeling about this combination. A, a good feeling about the team he's chosen and a good feeling about the tactics in battle they are using. This makes sense. This makes a lot of sense. It makes more sense than the previous translations we had for the mech's name... Uh, to, uh, it makes more sense than the previous names for the mech we have had. And, ah, uh, to the effect of co finally combining the teams, it kind of works. The way they have the sets for the show, though, make it so that each of the cockpits is a bit too small to have all seven of them together. So they sequestered them in different sections of the machine. The Pat two of the Pat Ranger on one sec in one cockpit, 
to the Lupin Ranger on the other in the other cockpit, and in the central cockpit is um, one Lupin Ranger, one Powder Ranger, and Lupin X. This works. I think the primary cockpit is usually where Good Striker is, and then the two auxiliary cockpits are up in the X Emperor train sections. Because as we've seen from previous episodes, there are two cockpits in X Emperor to accommodate when it does its flipping mode change from X Emperor Slash to X Emperor Gunner. This is how the logic, I feel, would pan out for that kind of thing, is otherwise they're just stuck randomly in their related team mechs, which, no, that would be silly. But yeah, the, of course, there's a funny thing here in that Kyrie, uh, Keichiro's demanding Kyrie follow his lead, and uh, they start infighting, so Good Striker just ex ejects Keichiro completely from the cockpit and brings in Tsukasa, because, again, Tsukasa is the one that can work on an even footing with the Lupin Ranger without alienating them. Sakya, in turn, I think would be deferring to the Lupin Ranger, so that is, again, a better balance, and showcasing that the Paddle Ranger team really should be led by Tsukasa. Let's hope that actually happens in following episodes. Now, um, I have to note something else about this fight scene. It is a mix between decent CGI animation and bad CGI animation, because we have finally reached the point with uh, Super Sentai mecha combinations where they can't build the suit if they actually want to showcase the mech, because it is that much of a clusterfuck. I mean, people say... Um, and you know, G12 is the one where they started to become cluster effects, but no, they could actually still build a suit. Um, the Kyo Ranger mechs, again, lesser combinations could do decent with, lay with the suits. Higher combinations, they were crap. Actually, I think every single Q Ranger combination mech bar the base forms was crap. Um, but the higher in combinations you get with these things, the less you can actually do them visually. So... Okay, save the CGI budget and keep them for when you need them and use lesser combinations elsewhere. Make it the really super powerful Uber form that just has, has just has usage limits. No. Instead, they went with really cheap, bad CGI for the grand majority of the fight scene. This CGI also got used a lot in Q-Ranger, but was first noted as appearing... Okay, actually, Q-Ranger would have premiered a bit before it, but regardless, this is a downgrade in animation quality to what was seen of Kill Ranger Brave. And as I said when I reviewed Kill uh, Ranger Brave, almost all of the CGI in that miniseries, only six episodes, the equivalent of six episodes of another series, I, might, I may remind you, was absolute shit. It was, it, it was really that bad. And co coupled with the directing issues of this show, and it's like, where is all the competency at Toei gone? I know Ke Koichi Sakamoto has been doing a lot for Tsuburaya as of late, and also Hurricane Polymer. I know that most of the, no of the qu uh, quality and competent writing staff are gone, or working on things that have proven to make Toei money, case in point Dragon Ball Super, versus how Connor Zio is going to be written by Kento Shimoyama, who is one of the two two worst writers at Toei currently, because Shoji Onomura is off ruining Yu-Gi-Oh! brains. But come on! It's like... You really... Are they that reaching for the bottom of the barrel shoestring on their budgeting? Is there something else coming up that they needed it for? Because this was kind of one of their big debut battles. One that everyone has to remember as a turning point and special moment of the show, and you're continuing to half-ass it? What the hell? Um, yeah, but regardless, it's a better time than I've been having with Lupat for a while now. Yeah, that went on longer than I wanted it to. Build, though. Final four episodes of the show. Next week, there is no episode, so I won't be recapping that, obviously, because it won't, wouldn't have aired. And it's pretty much the calm before the storm, where... Everybody's tr resting up as Evolt has called them out for one final battle over the Pandora panel and the fate of the Earth. If the Kamara can, can defeat Evolt, reach him, and, you know, give a good showing, he might actually spare Earth. If not, well, for every ten minutes that passes and they're climbing up the 
uh, Pandora Tower, he is going to destroy a different district of Japan. Translation on this one has been a bit off between Overtime and TV Nihon, but uh, as the way it's originally phrased in the episode by both groups is, you think he's destroying either Seito, Hokuto, or Toto. And no, he's just destroying smaller districts in each of them. So it's like they could fight for hours or even a day and there would still be surviving sections of Japan. It's just that, you know, widespread slaughter by everyone being sucked into a black hole. And that is, yeah, no, one of the one of the worst da ways to die. I mean, only they... Um, Toei has been doing the same thing with Evolt's powers in that they depict black holes as wormholes. Now, in the idea that last episode we got that it's not actually a black hole, but a wormhole condensing all that matter and converting into energy that powers Evolt, I guess the wormhole analogy isn't the worst thing because the science behind wormholes is they're supposed to do some type of matter-energy conversion um, case in point, Stargate's use of, use of the wormhole technology, um, where it just sends it all as data and inf and data information and energy broken down to then be re reassembled on the other side. If a if a black hole form is actually a misnomer for wormhole form, then the idea is that he opens up the wormhole and then never lets um, whoever he consumes out the other side, so they're trapped as data and energy, which he then absorbs. This is the best way we can think to relate how Evolt gains power from actually eating worlds through the use of black hole form and these wormholes and not black holes. Because black holes and wormholes are not the same thing. Do not make the same mistake Power Rangers, Dino Charge, and Ninja Steel did. Um, but on point, um... With this announcement, Sento figures out how to actually create the white Pandora panel, and it's by inserting the hazard trigger into the remaining uh, pieces of the Pandora's box. We have no idea where all the full bottles that used to be part of the Pandora panel, the completed Pandora's box, have gone at this point. They just keep showing the same blank Pandora's panel, so maybe they've been absorbed into the entirety of it. But regardless, they have the white Pandora panel now, and Sento knows what he's doing and will do with them. The black, um, the white Pandora panel will allow them to create a connection to another, um, Earth. They complete, they, uh, present this straight out. And then the black Pandora panel, with its ability to warp its users anywhere they want to, will then warp, um, the inhabitants of builds Earth to another world and leave Evolt alone. The idea through the use of both of these at the same time isn't just this connection and transportation, but an actual historical fusion. The inhabitants of Sento's world will be integrated in or fused with their counterparts in the populace of another world. They, um, they actually are very smart in this part in calling out how um, this could cause this to fuse with or overwrite their other world counterparts, which, of course, would be bad. Final Lightning Returns Final Fantasy XIII's ended on that. It is considered one of the worst endings for a Final Fantasy game in existence. And, yeah, they did a after-series audio drama slash novel, I'm forgetting which off the top of my head, that basically ruined any reading of the characters because, yeah, um, giving people out of nowhere, traumatic memories of a thousand years of suffering. Actually, I think it was 500, but it's the Fabinov Crystallis timeline. I really don't care which. But yeah, that, um, that much trauma, that many years of trauma put into someone who previously didn't host any of that? Extreme psychological issues to the point of um, those who would suffer it actually committing suicide. And we know this from other fiction, where people out of nowhere acquire memories that are not theirs or were suppressed for various awful, awful reasons. It is like a consistent thing about that it, uh, across all exploratory fiction that is a forgotten component in that ending. And Build could end up accidentally doing this if they present this the wrong way. They don't, of course, the way they go about it is saying they don't know what is going to happen, so any fallout of that is 
simply a result of not knowing. They are guilty of doing that to the populace, but they had no better options, and at least they would live. Versus, you know, doing it intentionally to someone else that was already a living, feasible being, and forcing yourselves upon them. Every time I touch on something from Badly Nova Castellus, it continues to get worse. But yeah, that's their plan. Recover the Black Pandora panel, get all the lost bottles into their black and gold states, and see if they can't um, simply just run or get away from a vault. Now, for some, this has also been a concern with the series' storytelling, because as I have broken Kamen Rider down to in its most basic aspects, Kamen Rider is the tale of a man rebelling against a world against a power or world order, not world order, a powerful order trying to make the world go wrong. It does not matter the source or the means by which they're doing it, though usually it helps if they're trying to twist uh, humanity into a imitation or um, monstrous facsimile of itself and fighting against that. And the moral of it, of it is... Um, you do not have the right to change the world to suit your whims and the most by retaining the best aspects of humanity those will it's not in so much a burning justice but intelligence camaraderie um strength of will um especially in the breakable will aspect those will help people um find the power ability or way to win within themselves to outright defeat this enemy power. We have seen, this is also overflown a bit into Super Sentai as well, most significantly again with people not understanding Kyoryuji, Daigo Kiryu was subject to this at the absolute end of Kyoryuji, and it was a running plot thread throughout Kyoryuji with the relation of the uh, Kyoryuji team, the human supporters, and um, the conflict, the contrast against it that was held by D-Boss. But back to the point, with evil being just so sheerly more powerful than any other character in the show, and in fact was the most powerful character even with Genius's debut, and it has the ability to evolve and advance even farther than that, it's like, you're kind of conflicting with this, and if your ultimate win button is to flee, you are going to ultimately let him win. You're ultimately going to allow the world order, trying to make the world go wrong, make the world go wrong. And you're just pushing the escape button and fleeing from his potential power. You will give your villain the win condition in the worst possible way you could fulfill that win condition. Whereas it would be smarter for the show to go the route of um, trapping Evolt in a pocket universe where, hey, you, everything is there for you to create on your own. You win. You get your goal of destroying everything so you can create it for yourself. While well, also leaving everybody, um, free to do as they wish on, and rebuilding their damaged, broken earth. As, hey, that's actually the way to, to go about this. You don't have the, you don't have the right to rewrite the world. It is the will of the people, the will of the masses, to make it in the best image for those who actually, you know, live here. Um, so this would be in conflict because, you know, you're escaping. Now, I know why they're doing this. Commodore Build is set on a other Earth entirely. It is an AR world. Toei has abandoned the AR world concept, even though it was only named in Decade, because continuity is a strength of storytelling. Any, it, Ignoring continuity, or throwing something out of continuity, is almost always bad storytelling, as in is an excuse for writers who are writing or acting in conflict to a greater canon. This is why I am so against the Garo different timelines thing, even as the show, you know, both presents contradiction and complementary evidence of that a, a successive continuity existing in the live-action shows, and then the anime series consistently uh, failing lore check. And we've seen this with Super Sentai, where um, after so many years, the idea that Super Sentai is all in a successive canon after, you know, people kept thinking they were completely separate um, timelines each series 
with Gokaiger, and that reinforced throughout the post uh, Gokaiger series. And then you get to Q Ranger and the person who helped to build the idea that these are one big continuity through the show out of canon. So, again, the reason they did that in both cases was because there were irreconcilable differences, irreconcilable mistakes, which would not allow them to be in canon. So it, that was a saving grace for both incidents. T um, connecting storytelling makes your world bigger. It makes your world grander. It helps give it a greater identity. And that is so important to selling your story. When, when Build set itself on another Earth, when Build clarified that it is taking place not in some aspect of the Kaminer uh, timeline that we just weren't aware of because the show hadn't been created yet, but an actual completely uh, different Earth, we were skeptical but accepted it because what was required for the backstory of the storytelling took precedence. If you can tell a stronger story by setting yourself apart from that, do it. It is not bad storytelling that way, as you're not going out of your way to ignore canon. You're, you're not make, going out of your way to ignore lore. You're making it so that your show can explore a different... Um, side of storytelling that does not require past knowledge. This is, and um, through the way they connected the two worlds in Heisei Generations Final, which is no longer final because Heisei Generations Forever has been announced, it mediated the issue entirely because it made it standalone, but not entirely separate from everything else. That is how you do it. You don't wipe away canon or lore for what you want to do, which will be in conflict with all of that. You set it as a standalone thing so it can work on its own, but still bear connection to the motifs and res be respectful to the greater franchise. The Power Rangers examples that have done this, the Gar examples have done, I have cited that have done this, have entirely failed this check, because their, their excuse for throwing out canon, or, or the, excuse, the excuse that would be given for throwing out canon, in, at least in the Garo side, if it was acknowledged that um, um, they're actually out of can um, the anime series were actually out of canon with everything else, is they're so in conflict with everything else that we have seen and done before, and they have not been to the strengths of those series storytelling. With Build, it is because they maintained the connection. With Super Sentai and the standalone nature of its series, it usually is because they're not calling back to these previous series out of crossover events, because those would um, supersede the showcasing of the main the stories of the actual main characters we should be caring about. Gokaiger most prominently shows this with how... Um, even when previous Super Sentai characters would make their presence known and be seen, it was always... They always made sure that the Gokaiger were at the forefront. It was not an event that was about um, the returning characters. It was about how those returning characters would help to influence the journey of uh, the mains. That is how you show... This is that's again how you should the perfect how you perfectly acknowledge canon in a series where um, the emphasis is on these current main characters. Don't call back without reason. I I kind of lost the. See, this is why I like writing these up and have been struggling with these vlogs a lot. I I lose the tra my train of thought or ramble on, but point is, bottom line. Build's characters are getting recreated, re, um, reintegrated into the mainline Earth. Who knows how the continuity snafus will result from that? But it's basically the decay. It's a, basically a radiation of the decayed timeline crunch. 
And when I realize that, they're, pre they're basically taking Build's AR world and smashing its continuity back into the main uh, common order timeline, I realized, Decay did this on accident. And I don't mean the show, I mean the writer. As all throughout Counter Decayed, they um, guilt tripped Decay Tsukasa Kadoya as the destroyer of worlds by causing this world merger on accident, as simply by his powers existing. And I'm like, you need the full power of Pandora's box and um, are going to manipulate the power of a Nyon demigod that is crushing every character in the show outright. And just to do something that Decay did simply by existing. I'm not sure if this again breaks the standard power tier rankings of Kamen Rider and reasserts Decay as the most powerful Kamen Rider if he actually innately has the power to do this. But I'm like, wow, that's kind of... Actually, when you think about this in a retroactive sense, if they're infinite parallel Earths and they're fusing one, who's to say this isn't what caused... Who's to say that um, since wormholes are nonlinear signs, since um, time is not consistent among realities, who's to say that Sento using the Pandora panels and the power of Pandora's box to fuse Build's Earth with another Kamen Rider's Earth, or another, just another world entirely, which will, of course, be the mainline Earth, since time is not consistent, what if Sento's world is actually the last AR world that, due to time not being equivalent, we saw we actually saw this consistently with uh, Heisei Generations Final, in that in the main Kamen Rider Earth, only a week had passed since Sento stole Emu Hojo Kamer X8's powers, whereas in Build's Earth it had been two years. Who's to say that timeline wise, Sento's use of the Pandora panels to fuse the Earths didn't actually occur as the last event? What it was what if it was actually the first event on this Fusion of Worlds trip that happened decayed, and Tsukasa just got blamed for it because of course, when you actually look at the events of Decade, nothing Decade does actually ends up fusing the worlds. It was actually all die shockers, manipulations of things that had nothing to do with Decade beyond him using other commoners' powers. So, again, with the the explanation of that being so bad, what who's to say that Sento was the one that actually accidentally set this off if um, the power or energy requirements required for this world fusion are devastatingly high that it requires massive machines and this mystical world destroying world warping universe destroying artifact you kind of i mean okay xa bro <laughs> excuse me xa <coughs> xa broke the power tier scaling for common rider this is accepted but it's it's impressive that your win button that requires Reality breaking powers are the most basic abilities held by a writer nine years ago. Just wow. But regardless, it's a good plan. And the um, team build have a final night to actually, you know, calm before the storm it and relax with food and camaraderie and finally bringing everybody together. Gentoku is, of course, shoved to the side. Kazumi has his fourth wall breaks with regards to his idol otakuism that, of course, blew up in his face. <coughs> and Kazumi, <coughs> Kazumi asks um, Sento to build him a power-up item for this final battle, but it turns out Sento always intended the Blizzard Knuckle to go to Kazumi. It's just that due to Kazumi getting that last hit of nebula gas injection alongside Gentoku, which um, which he ran off to do, like, an episode or two before. Well, now the power-up upgrade... Now the Blizzard Knuckle is lethal to him. And that is pretty much why we haven't seen Grease Blizzard, which is the form's name before this, so all I can use it is a attack knuckle like Ryuga originally did if he doesn't want to die from its use. 
Spoilers, Kazumi uses it at the end of the episode to become Grace Blizzard. And you kind of saw this coming. They were lampshading it pretty heavily, but it's like, okay, why are you killing off Otoya Karenai again? It's like, they, people have been seeing the parallels to this since the, um, since the previous first drop about him using this device, and the lampshading that he keeps getting these, ha these, uh, nebula gas injections that are more and more likely to kill him. Something I'm also realizing is that Sento could remove Kazumi's ability to die with the powers of genius, and this not be a problem at all, so why didn't you do that? It seems kind of foolish for you to not have done that. You won't have the high, as high a hazard level by this negation ability, but Bli uh, B Grease Blizzard is going to more than make up for that. So, like, you're letting a character die for no reason, Sento. At least it really feels like you are with how this, the, all these plot points have come together, and yet one of the big abilities of genius has been forgotten. So yeah, they invade the Pandora the Pandora Tower to get at the black the black panel and to win Evolt's game to save the Earth. And who should Evolt set up as their enemies but the three crows of, crows of Hokuto to close out Kazumi's little story with them. And yeah, he gets his ass beaten before he finally uses the blizzard knuckle to transform. Also using Sento's father's discarded build driver, so that's where he gets the device, so yay there. And then, of course, we get the end of episode transformation, which then immediately cuts to the credits. Build has done this five times now. At least I feel like it's five times. Hazard, Genius, Black Hole Form... I don't think it was Magma, I think it was Mad Rogue. Uh, no, several... Actually, I think all of Vilt's forms have actually done that, so it's been more than five times that they have done this. We hate it because almost every time a show does this, the follow-up battle that results from it is utterly crap, because it is then an afterthought to the main thrust of the next episode's story. We saw this with Mugen before, we saw this with a few related Kamara forms earlier when they would debut it at the end of episodes, only to be a reckless power-up that doesn't get a good showcasing, or um, they could have just held off on the transformation until later in the next episode's story, which would have worked just as well. Drive-type formula was a better, a great example of this, because the first transformation, we don't actually see it in action at all. We just cut to um, Shinosuke Tamari being heavily injured after its first use, which could have also resulted from him getting curb stomped so hard that the formula shift car had to come in to, like, break up the battle with its own acceleration abilities without actually needing the transformation, since the first battle with the transformation is not showcased, and everything else with the actual form debut battle did just as well or better what would have been shown up, what it would have shown up in that battle anyways. It's like, it's been a big problem with Bill doing that, and it's it's cheap, it's cheap, baseless tension for it, because then you have us waiting two weeks to actually see what this thing actually does. And don't get me wrong, Grease Blizzard looks excellent. It's this definitely ice-toned metallic blue that is just glorious. It is an excellent recolor of the main Grease suit, and from Im preview images, it has the Hokuto Three Crows um, smash emblems on one pauldron and the standard Grease logo on the other. And it's just, it, it is wonderful soup construction upgrade, even though it is obviously such a cheap change. And yet I'm completely sold by it because it is a masterful recolor. And hell, they even put on the um, Robo half bodies. Robot Arn on it on his left hand as a replacement for the Twin Breaker. That is also that also looks very good, and that showcases that this is a further evolution of the Robot Full Bottle and Robot Slash Jelly, like very similar or in the same vein to how Ryuga got his upgrade with his own Magma Knuckle. So I'm totally sold on the form. I'm less sold on Kazumi dying to even use it because. I'm feeling like this is not going to be a good death. 
it, they're they're setting up all of the death flags for it. It would be nice if they subverted it and made it so he dropped out at the last possible second to not kill himself, but let's face it, it's the end of the series. We're expecting at least one fatality, and with how they keep setting up the vault, I would not it would not surprise me if half the cast actually died. Ah, uh, so yeah. Good episode of Build. Some things to critique, um, some things that could definitely be expanded upon or more presented in full with a uh, broader look at the lore. I'm liking the idea of them refusing the Earths for the timeline stuff, simply because I like simple con continuity timelines that succeed are made up of successive entries, because it is not that goddamn hard to research previous entries in a successive franchise. And, like, it doesn't make up for so much frustration of the last few episodes, or the um, face plant the war arc has resulted, but it seems to be ba hitting back to its good points um, now that they're actually working to wrap up the series. Um, before I go, um, in the last week I have had over 20 copyright claims from Toei, Saban, and Viacom. Um, YouTube updated its content ID bots, or at least the automation process, so people are getting across the board, a lot of more um, claims on things that previously didn't have them. Josh Knight the First, who has also been doing uh, Commander and yeah, just Commander recaps over part of uh, his own channel in collaboration with his wife, Mars Girl, also had a number of his videos hit. I know Zeltrax Millennium got hit. I didn't hear if any of the RVT crew got hit, but it's been going around the Toku community that a lot of videos have been going down. Um, I've been hand having motor control issues in my hand. Specifically, I've been having a um, repetitive stress injury in my thumb. So I, once I get Hibiki done, I'm going to be going on a long hiatus from doing formal reviews. And it's like, it's increasing the stress a lot to actually be able to get all those back up. So... I'm working on it. I'm going to get Hibiki done. I'm going to then I'm going to start um, re-rendering all of those out. Right now, I'm making sure that all of the Blade videos are going to stay up. I got copyright claims on the last few parts of that, which will be going up this the, in the next two weeks. So I'm focusing on getting those up for people. But the Camera Double view reviews have been hit. The um, Kill Ranger reviews have been hit. The O Ranger rev reviews have been hit. The Mega Ranger reviews are surprisingly not touched, but all the po related Power Rangers ones to those adaptations are definitely hit. Black X was hit hard. I think Black was okay. I'll have to double check that. Knowing how this has been going the last week, there have been a lot more videos taken down that I probably am not aware of. So, yeah. For anyone just wondering about the status of those, um, I'm working on getting them back, but it'll take me some time. Yeah, I, that's gone on for way longer than I intended to this week, but yeah, got a lot covered, so I'll see you all next time.